Hej Ushua. Hej Anna. Today my guest is Eduardo Ushua. He's an associate professor at Universidade Federal Fluminense in Niterói, Brazil. His research areas include the theory and application of integer programming approaches for solving large NP-hard combinatorial optimization problems. In particular, he had made groundbreaking contributions for the joint use of column and cut generation techniques in the so-called branch cut and price algorithms. He's an author of many efficient exact algorithms for a number of problems such as Steiner problems, vehicle routing, scheduling, network design, 1D and 2D cutting problems, among others. He also worked on several applied problems from the industry and has been nominated as finalist in the Wagner Prize for Excellence in OR Practice for optimizing the helicopter transport of oil rig crews at Petrobras. He had also been awarded as co-author of the best paper published in 2017 in mathematical programming computation. Recently, Ushua was involved in the development of VRP Solver, a generic and customizable BCP solver that currently provides the best exact algorithm for most classical VRP variants, and also for some other kinds of optimization problems. He is author and co-author of several papers that have appeared in leading journals such as MathProg, uh, MathProg Computation, Informs Journal on Computing, Transportation Science, EGER, CNOR, Networks, Interfaces, and in conferences like IPCO. Ushua was one of my PhD advisors together with Professor Luis Aturuochi. He was and still is a great mentor and of course one of my heroes. Ushua, it, it is a great honor to have you here. It means a lot to me. <laughs> thank you so much. Muito obrigado. How are you? Tudo bem? Well, thank you Anna, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to, to be with you in your channel. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Ushua, I know you lived in so many places uh, when you were a kid. Um, uh, but where you were actually born? Well, uh, I was born in Brasilia. Brasilia is uh, the capital of Brazil. But uh, I lived very little there. Uh, when I was one year old, uh, my parents moved to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we, we lived there for some years. And then uh, they moved again to Recife, that uh, northeast part of Brazil, so uh, close to where you are. Then uh, we went back to Rio and lived some more years there. Then my family moved again, this time to Belen. Belen is uh, Amazon region of Brazil, so very far from Rio. And then they moved to Presidente Prudente, is a medium town in the state of Sao Paulo. And my parents are still living there. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of moves. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your mom is actually from Campina Grande here in Paraíba, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, I think uh, I feel uh, more like Carioca because of the was the city that I lived uh, for most time during my childhood. Uh, but a lot with uh, Paulista from Sao Paulo uh, and a bit from Northeast from my family of my mother. Right. Uh, and what did you do <laughs> when you were growing up? Well, had a normal childhood, uh, but I had my interests uh, uh, as a young child, say uh, seven or eight years old. Uh, I loved to read the encyclopedia. And uh, yes, and uh, when the adults asked me why, uh, I used to say, uh, I want to be a scientist. And uh, okay, they found it cute. But the, they took that as seriously as if I were saying that I want to be an astronaut. Because uh, in the 70s, for the Brazilian general public, science was something that was done in places like NASA or other similar places, uh, but not in Brazil, not in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, later discovered that uh, that was not true. At the time, uh, there were some great scientists in Brazil, but uh, no one knew about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my mom also loved to read encyclopedias, uh, she told me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we have a couple of them here still. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you, I, I, I know you, you took interest in, in computers when you were, uh, when you became a teenager or something, right? Yes, uh, when I was 14, 
uh, I received a personal computer as a Christmas gift. Uh, it was a basic machine uh, connected to a black and white TV set. Uh, the memory was 32 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, and it has a built-in basic interpreter. So uh, I learned my first programming language was basic. And uh, about six months later, I got a part-time job. I worked that uh, afternoon, uh, actually in the same office where my father worked. And uh, my job was to type data into their computer. Uh, it was a personal computer, a, a bit more powerful. Uh, for basic office tasks. And uh, eventually in that job, I started to program two in uh, the base two language. And uh, the, the overall experience was good. So I decided to follow computer science. Right, so when you discover computers and, and you had that, that uh, sort of a part-time job, that kind of changed your life because I think it had a huge influence in the university degree that you picked later on, right? Yes, so uh, when I was 17, uh, I could enter at the uh, University of Campinas, uh, Unicamp. Uh, Unicamp is located in Campinas, uh, it's in Sao Paulo state. Uh, Sao Paulo is a big state, it's 500 kilometers for, from where my parents live. And uh, Unicamp, they did something interesting. They did a very success, successful scientific communication campaign in the 80s. So uh, almost every Saturday evening on the national TV news, there was like a five minute block showing some research from their labs, from Unicamp. And I was attracted by that. So that's the reason I choose uh, Unicamp. And uh, it was a great environment, so the libraries were great. Uh, they offer culture, they offer sports. Mm. And, uh, I practiced long distance running, uh, even adventure sports. I had the opportunity to so uh, rock climbing and cave exploration. And, wow. uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, in spite of the fact that I was short of money, uh, the university provided a lot to us. Uh, we had cheap meals at the university restaurant, and I even lived for three years uh, for free at the university housing. So uh, they offered a lot to me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Were you a top student? Uh, well, <laughs> this is a, a tricky question, but <laughs> actually uh, I was uh, an irregular student. Uh, that means that uh, I did well in some courses, got good grades, but in many other courses, uh, if I did not like the subject, if I did not like the teacher, I only got the, the minimum passing grade. Uh, this is not something that uh, I'm proud of, but okay. Uh, I was young at the time. I had several other competing interests in and this, this is past. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and your first contact with linear programming, according to the story you told me years ago, was not uh, the best of it? Yes, uh, actually, uh, I failed. The first time I took the <laughs> linear programming course, I failed. It's a big uh, irony. But uh, what happens uh, that I start the course and uh, I had to do the simplex tableau by hand. I found that, that boring. Then uh, after primal simplex, it uh, was dual simplex and revised simplex. And uh, so I had other interests at the time. Uh, perhaps I was in love. And then uh, <laughs> I did not study for the exam and I failed. So <laughs> that happened. Wow. And yeah. uh, of course, I, I had to take it again. And uh, the second time, uh, I realized that the uh, simplex algorithm is beautiful and uh, it was OK. But uh, I learned it from that experience because, experience because uh, I teach LP mm -hmm. <laughs> today. <laughs> and the uh, first thing that I learned is that uh, in my course, I spend a lot of time on modeling. So I try to present non-trivial and creative models mm -hmm. because in the course that I failed, the, the modeling was done in one or two classes and only very basic models like the diet problem. Mm -hmm. So I try to present many interesting models and the second thing is that uh, a single variant of the simplex algorithm is enough for undergrads. So mm -hmm. uh, 
because all those algorithms are already coded in the packages, the, the students will never uh, need to, to code the, mm -hmm. the, it's ready. The bottleneck for using LP in practice is the modeling. The modeling is difficult. So this is what we should teach an undergrad. Mm -hmm. so the, the, but I learned it from my experience. Yeah. I also try to balance a lot uh, modeling with the theory itself. Uh, it can be very boring for students just to see the simplex algorithm and so on. At the same time, we have to be careful to teach important concepts such as duality. No, yes, but not duality is yes. very important. Yeah, yes. yeah right. Uh, I know you liked Schwato's book a lot, right? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> no, I have the book here with me. I really? Select oh. Books <laughs> I select some books that I love to show you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I could not see that coming. Uh, right, so uh, did you have any experience with research uh, during the undergrad period? Yes, so uh, Nikamp uh, was a um, extraordinary place. Uh, so I followed, uh, I participated in a project uh, actually in uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, with Professor Cecilia Baranauskas, uh, it's about processing queries in natural languages. So it means that the user would type queries in Portuguese and we would try to parse the query and execute them. And uh, we used the, for that the Prolog language that uh, together with Lisp was very used for artificial intelligence at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to confess that I was a bit disappointed by our results. So, and, uh, but uh, in general, artificial intelligence in the early 90s still felt short of expectations, uh, mm -hmm. not like today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so you graduated at some point, and what did you do uh, next? Uh, my first decision was not to follow an academic career. Okay, uh, and, uh, what was my in my mind at the time? Uh, that would have been the comfortable path because uh, uh, so I decided to leave leave the sheltered life that I had at Unicamp. I, I would try to work in the industry uh, and go to São Paulo. The, São Paulo is the biggest city in Latin America and uh, to see how the real world outside the academy was like, mm -hmm. was my uh, thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you started a job there and how was it? Yes, uh, I got a job at a financial institute. Uh, it was actually a very interesting job uh, because uh, it was related to artificial intelligence because oh. uh, my job was to build expert, in, expert systems for operating in future markets and, uh, and they use it prolog language so the language that I had already learned in my undergrad mm -hmm. I was using it and uh, the title my official title at that company was knowledge engineer so <laughs> <interesting>. <laughs> sounds uh, fancy <laughs> Yes, because my job was to somehow collect the knowledge from market people and put it in that uh, expert system. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, but uh, you got uh, bored or what made you uh, leave yeah. the job? Yes, yeah, it was not exactly bored, but uh, it was a good experience. But uh, so I had a job that was related to research. Uh, had to, uh, that company they had a library so uh, <laughs> and then after one year doing that kind of research applied research uh, that framework I discovered how much better it would be to do free research <laughs> to do research in the top of my choice mm -hmm. so I decided to go back to university and try to follow an academic career so uh, it was very important so I came back to university to pursue an academic career mm -hmm. but this time I was sure that uh, this what this is what uh, I really wanted mm -hmm. so you went back to Unicamp yes uh, I went back, back to, to Unicamp Campinas. Campinas. Yeah. yes and uh, so how was the experience well uh, I arrived there uh, I want to do something related to theoretical computer science, but I had no clue about the precise area. Uh, then I took a, a quite advanced graph theory course with Professor Claudio Lucchesi, 
Uh, at that time, I was already 24 years old and was still an absolute beginner in graph theory. And I realized that uh, I could not compete with the Hungarians that study combinatorial math since high school. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, why I'm saying that? Because uh, that course, we had to study a uh, 20, pa 20 pages long proof by Laszlo Lovas. <laughs> so it was really tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, my decision, I should choose something where my hard-earned computer science skills would matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I took a course in integer programming. So, uh, uh, so I barely know what integer programming was. Uh, integer programming was linear programming with integer variables. Mm -hmm. So what I expected, uh, they will teach me the simplex for integer pro a variant of simplex math. Uh, I already knew how to do simplex mm -hmm. by hand at that time. <laughs> And uh, I imagined it would be an easy course, and uh, I could not be more wrong, uh, because as we know, there's no simplex algorithm for IP. Uh -huh. uh, instead, uh, there are a bunch of techniques, uh, each technique being useful only on certain subset of the problems. Uh, the textbook was Nenhauser Wolf. Yeah, I, I bring the book here. Come on, you're collecting the book. <laughs> So this is not a gentle introduction to the area, uh -huh. but my teacher was Marcus Poggi Jaragão. Uh -huh. So Marcus Poggi Jaragão, and he showed a great enthusiasm for the area. His class were very enthusiastic, and I decided to ask him to be my advisor. So, uh, and I really enjoyed uh, doing something that uh, at the same time had a strong mathematical background but also very direct in practical applications. Mm -hmm. And what was the topic of your dissertation? Well, uh, my master dissertation, uh, I worked on, I did a, a branch and cut and a, a separate algorithm, a, a branch and cut and a branch and price algorithm for a clustering problem mm -hmm. with connectivity constraints. Mm -hmm. You got a publication for that, from that work, correct? Yes, uh, the, that the work was eventually published in a European <laughs> Journal of Operational Research. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so, continuing with your studies and uh, pursuing a PhD was a natural path, but you you decided to leave Unicamp and go back to your Carioca roots, if you like. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I had already uh, graduated in Unicamp, did the master in Unicamp, uh, I had to leave. No? And uh, my advisor, Marcos Poggi, he was moving to Rio, to the Catholic University of Rio, to book. And uh, I decided to follow him, uh, mm -hmm. in the sense I applied to, to the PhD there, and uh, they accepted me, and then I went back to Rio. That was my desire to, uh, I felt like living in Rio again, uh, had strong connections with Rio. And uh, in fact, my PhD time, four years, uh, it was a good time. I lived in Leblon, it's a nice neighborhood in Rio. It's close to the beach, it's close to, to Puk too. It was a, a good time. Yeah, so you went from clustering problems to uh, the packing of two Steiner trees. <laughs> switch yes. problems completely uh, yes and so now uh, i started my phd i was a bit more mature and i struggling to produce some uh, nice results for my thesis so i started studying the packing of two standard trees so the the classic standard trees you have a set of terminals and you want to connect it by the shortest tree uh, the packing of two standard trees you have two sets of terminals you have to connect each set by a tree and those trees should be disjoint and uh, so in the beginning of my second year uh, I had produced some theoretical results uh, identifying families of facets for producing a branch and cut algorithm and then I spent like six months trying to improve, improve my implementation and uh, those months would influence my future career a lot because what happened uh, I already had most of the theoretical results in the beginning. 
but uh, after a sequence of uh, computational tricks, we may call it like that, but uh, the size of the indices that I could solve increased from 100 vertices to 10,000 vertices, so a 100 wow. time increase. And ever since, I believe that uh, the beautiful theoretical results are great or necessary, but they are not the end of the story. A uh, good implementation is also crucial. So it was uh, that set my path in career. So the combined the theoretical ideas with uh, implementation, uh, strong focus mm -hmm. on implementation. Uh -huh. And you, you were rewarded for that. You got your first IPCO paper accepted. Yes, that was great. Uh, the paper was accepted at IPCO 1999. And uh, so uh, one day in January 1999, uh, we had no telephone or internet in our place. And then uh, I was at home on a Sunday morning and Marcus knocked on the door with the news that we had been accepted. And uh, that was great. And, uh, and in June 1999, I came to Grass, to Austria, to attend the APCO. So uh, I did not present, so uh, Marcus did the talk. Uh, but I was almost 29, and that uh, was my first time out of South America. So uh, I had been in Buenos Aires one year before, but that was my first time in Europe. And I used that opportunity to, to, to travel, to backpack for three weeks. Uh, I went to Spain, to Italy, Austria, Netherlands, and France. So mm -hmm. it was great <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh, relatively late uh to to i mean you were quite old uh with all respect <laughs> uh, uh, but uh it's it's usually the first experiences international experiences and you when you were uh, uh you know in this academic life and doing research comes a little bit earlier uh mm -hmm. at least but uh, uh, at the same time it was not very cheap to, to travel abroad right yes uh until the mid 90s the brazilian currency was very devalued so it was very expensive to travel to places like united states and europe and only rich people do that so uh this is a but the 29 is, is still okay <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and i'm joking of course <laughs> you you still kept on working in steiner problems Yes, uh, well, uh, after the, the IPCO paper, uh, I was in a comfortable situation in my PhD because I already had the material for the thesis and I could spend uh, two additional years working on something else. And, uh, well, the packing of two standard trees was interesting, but it was a problem that no one had studied before, so no exact algorithms for that problem. So I was solving instances that I had myself, I created. And I need to try my hand at some classic problem, trying to solve instances that many other people have already tried. And the natural choice was, of course, the, the classic standard problem in graphs. So uh, I started doing uh, pre-processing procedures. And then uh, I met uh, a master's student at PUC. Uh, his name is Renato Bernac. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, he was already uh, a quite strong researcher uh, after he did his PhD at Princeton with Tarjan and today he's the chief uh, algorithm design one of the chief algorithm designers at Amazon yeah he spent a lot of time uh, at Microsoft research too right yes yes and uh, we formed the team so uh, together with Marcus and one of the articles with uh, Celso Ribeiro too and uh, we created a uh, package containing primal heuristics, dual heuristics, and a branch and cut grids, and we got good results mm -hmm. in, the, in the classic style. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you did a lot in your PhD. You, you, I think you published really well. And uh, most importantly, you learn uh, many, many things. Uh, I think that, that paved the way for your career later. And uh, you, you, so you finish your PhD, and uh, what did you do right after that? Well, right after the PhD, uh, well, as you mentioned, we have published uh, three papers on Stein's problem, but a few people knew about our work. Yeah. And then uh, in 2001, uh, a Tunisian professor, uh, Hidam Ajoub, uh, works in France, 
he came to Rio for one month, invited by Marcus Podium. And uh, we start some collaboration together. And uh, meeting Rida Majuk was very important to me because uh, he uh, helped me a lot in the beginning of my career and uh, still helps. So we have a long term uh, collaboration with many exchanges. But uh, at that time, when I was a fresh PhD, he invited me to spend uh, one month at his university at uh, Clermont-Ferrand. He was there at the time. And uh, before that, it, he got me an invitation to attend the OSUA 2002 workshop before that visit. So OSUA is a workshop, invitation only. And uh, he got me, he uh, recommended my name to organize it. So I was invited to that uh, workshop. Wow. Uh, Hidama Jubo was a very important guy in, in your career. Yes, yes. Uh, he already invited me many times. Uh, now he's in Paris. Uh, even uh, he sent uh, students from uh, Paris Dauphine to spend some time with us here in Brazil. So we have a very strong uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. He's uh, helped me a lot. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think it's worth uh, mentioning about the particularities of uh, the OSWA workshop. <laughs> yes, it, uh, it's interesting because, uh, well, in Oswa, no one knows in advance when and even if they will speak. Okay, so organizer just asks, are you willing to speak? And you say yes. So every afternoon, the organizer, they post in a wall the program for the next day. Okay. And happy, uh, very happily, I would say, I, my name was there in the, fir in the first uh, day. So I was scheduled to the first section of the morning afternoon. And uh, of course, I did not sleep well that night. <laughs> and, uh, I was nervous to present our standard works to an audience with so many famous people that I only knew the, by name from the papers. But after the first five minutes, the talk goes and uh, after that, you know, I had already present, so I could relax and enjoy the workshop. And uh, that was a time when I met a number of uh, younger researchers from my own generation. Uh, so it was a uh, very important uh, to my mm -hmm. beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. very How's your English? So-so, uh, because uh, even today is not too good. Come on. But uh, I had studied English uh, in Brazil, but uh, I had little opportunity for practicing, but so-so, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but you managed, that's important. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so you had your PhD adventure, you went to Oswa, uh, you, you had the chance to meet uh, young researchers. That's all nice, but at, at some point you had to find a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and finding a position at that time, uh, early two thousands, I think it was not so easy. How did you manage? Yes, yes the, the positions were scarce in Brazil at the time, and, uh, but happily, uh, I got a position at the uh, University Federal Fluminense uh, at the Production Engineering Department. It was not in computer science. Uh, and uh, they had a lab, the largest lab. This is where I am now. <laughs> I am the, the largest lab. <laughs> and uh, literally, uh, physically, you are there. Yes, I'm physically. There, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that lab uh, in 2006, uh, Arthur Pessoa uh, joined that lab. Uh, he's a highly talented researcher, excellent programmer, uh, not as well known in the community as he deserved. And uh, uh, then in 2007, I moved to Niterói because uh, in the beginning I was living in Rio and commuting every day. And uh, so I moved to Niterói and uh, people from Rio, they, uh, they usually mock people <laughs> from Niterói because they say that it's a boring place. And uh, of course, Niterói is not a capital like Rio, it's not an international vibrant city as Rio, but it's a very nice place and we are very close to Rio. So when we want to enjoy Rio, we take a car and go there. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the name of Arthur Pessoa can help, but uh, you know, paying uh, my respects to him. I, I mean, he's also one of my heroes. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Very talented, super nice guy. And you shared the office for uh, mm -hmm. several years. 
and happily I was I was there doing PhD when you were do and you were guys sharing the office and I could witness you guys in action. It was fantastic experience, uh, you know, you guys debating, arguing, going back and forth, uh, and and I think you were push, pushing each other um, to to do better research and so on. And it was wonderful and. Uh, I was so lucky to 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 be there and you know learn from you guys and you know with Arthur I still collaborate to this day you know he's a he's a fantastic guy and on a side note his mom is also from Paraíba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a strong connection strong with Paraíba. Con yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, you you join uh, Logis and it's uh, it's a lab there known for doing logistics and. It's, I assume it's when you started working with VRPs? Uh, yes, but uh, actually uh, the people from uh, Lodges at the time, they were uh, more interested in the practical aspects of logistics and uh, they did not have a, say, a strong mathematical interest. And uh, my path to VRP was a bit different actually. Uh, what, what happened? Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, integer programming for specific problems was dominated. There are two groups of people. There were the cutters, so the people that uh, built branch and cut algorithms. So uh, they tried to find the families of uh, inequalities and build branch and cut algorithms. And a smaller group, a second group, were, were the pricers, people that uh, did the column generation and branch and price algorithms. And of course, many people consider the possibility of joining both approaches and uh, to produce a branch cut and price algorithm. But uh, the obstacle was how to take the additional dual variables into account in the pricing. So you add a, a new cut and you have a new variable, you have to take into account in the pricing. And uh, in the beginning of 2003, we, uh, Marcus and I, we realized that, that certain cuts could be added without changing the pricing. And this led to what we call it robust branch cut and price. Uh, the robust is not in the sense of robust optimization. It was the sense that the algorithm itself was robust mm -hmm. because non-robust branch cut and price is likely to be unstable. Because uh, you add uh, 10 cuts, okay, then you add more 10 cuts and the pricing explodes. And uh, actually, uh, this is not a completely new idea because uh, at least four previous works presented algorithms that now we would classify them as being robust branch cut and price algorithms. Yet they did not realize the big potential impact of that uh, technique. And uh, this is uh, where uh, Velka Rauta started, because we tested this idea of robust branch cut and price on CVRP and capacitate mm -hmm. Velka routing problem. And uh, in fact, it could obtain a, a breakthrough uh, in that problem. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you solved all problems up to 135 customers to optimality. Yes, right. before the, the best algorithms were uh, branch and cut algorithms, but some instances with un only 50 customers were still open and we could move that to 135. Yeah. Uh, was it hard to call and were, were there many people involved? Yes, and many people, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the paper has uh, seven co-authors because uh, many people were coding uh, one were working in the, the pricing other uh, in the cuts uh, so we have uh, several co-authors and uh, but the paper was published uh, first at IPCO 2004 and then mathematical programming and uh, this is still my most cited work yeah I, I know that worked pretty well you, you even handed over me a, a physical copy of that <laughs> paper. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's, you, you published, I mean, the paper came out officially in 2006, right? Mm -hmm. In Matt Prague. Um, I met, actually, I saw you uh, in 2007, was the first time I saw you uh, at our Brazilian OR conference. You were giving a tutorial or a short term course, if you will in column generation, eh? about column generation. Mm -hmm. And I was there with my friend Hugo Kramer, who later became your 
student as well. Uh, and on that very same conference, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Luisa Turuochi was very kind to, to invite me to UF. Uh, and uh, eventually I, I, I joined uh, the, the PhD program there in 2008. And uh, I remember this this uh, seminar that he arranged me. So uh, he was super kind, and you know he wanted me to, uh, you know, uh, present the work I did during the masters. And then uh, after I don't know ten or fifteen minutes of presentation, you you came up, uh, and then you 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 joined the, the the presentation exactly when I was presenting a formulation. Uh, it was a two commodity uh, formulation for the VRP with simultaneous pickup and delivery. And then after the presentation, you said, look, I, I think you can improve that by adding cuts or something. And then I, I got really interested. Um, and then uh, the next day I knocked uh, at the largest door and we, we decided to, to, you know, explore the idea of adding cuts and so on. And after a couple of um, weeks or months, I'm, I don't remember really, really well, but Professor uh, Satoru, he, he uh, agreed to, to invite you to be my co-advisor, uh, and, and it, was, it was really wonderful. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we also tried uh, to work on the CVRP, uh, right? Remember that? <laughs> yes, uh, you did uh, an excellent PhD and uh, produced good results on uh, generic risks for many variants of uh, VRP. And uh, you have uh, your pet problem is the VRP with simultaneous pickup and delivery, and we produce a, a branch and cut and a branch and cut and price. And then uh, we tried it together uh, some new ideas on the classic CVRP because I, I was still very interested in CVRP, trying to improve the, the results. And we tried some, uh, some new ideas, kind of. Uh, Banders cuts and Fancho cuts. cuts yeah. We worked a lot on that <laughs> and uh, we failed. <laughs> the results were not good. The, that was never published. But uh, this is part of uh, research. Uh, when you do true research, you, you fail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never fail. fail you are not doing research. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of it. Yeah. I learned a lot actually from what it did not work. Because we really had to put um, my mind into it, in code complicated stuff, but uh, but that gave insights to other uh, ideas we had. Even when we we tried that uh, uh, hybrid algorithm combining uh, the heuristic with the set partitioning idea, uh, we we tried to add cuts to the set partitioning <laughs> formulation. It 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 worked, but uh, I mean the, the, we got validated cuts and so on, but uh, in practice, but it was uh, the, the improvement was really marginal, and we eventually we gave up on that. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was it was a fantastic time in my life, uh, you know, working with you guys, with Satoru, you, and even Artu also, who was almost like a third advisor to me. So it was excellent. Uh, you got an invitation to to contribute to the famous. Uh, Todd and Vigo book on VRPs? Yes, uh, Paulo Todd and uh, Daniel Vigo invited us, uh, Marcos and I, to write a book chapter on uh, exact algorithms for CVRP for the second uh, edition of their famous book. Uh, I have the book here too. <laughs> Here's the book. <laughs> Well, uh, in order to do that, uh, we had to carefully read all the recent literature on the exact algorithms, of not only for CVRP, but also for related problems like VRP with time windows. And uh, there were uh, big new contributions like the NG route, the idea of uh, enumeration, first enumeration to a MIPS over, then enumeration to a pool, the, the subset row cut the uh, hierarchical strong branching. So uh, you interviewed some people that contributed a lot for that, like uh, Roberto, uh, the singer, Contard and Martinelli. And uh, we had a PhD student at the time, Diego Pessin, and we decided that the, the best way of understanding all of that stuff was implementing everything and testing. So we re-implemented every idea that appeared in the literature and tests very, very extensively. 
So uh, we learn a lot about uh, those techniques and uh, eventually uh, we came up with new ideas. When you re-implement something, uh, then it's quite uh, uh, natural that uh, you uh, realize some things that uh, the authors did not realize it, so you improve it that. And uh, actually, it was a together with the, the scene. I had uh, another six months of very obsessive work. <laughs> it was in the first semester of uh, 2013, so I, we worked from night to day on that, and. Uh, and there was a, a breakthrough. Uh, what was a, there was one idea that, uh, if, besides all the ideas that uh, I mentioned that uh, we implemented, there was one idea that made a lot of difference. It is the concept of uh, limited memory uh, cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the, the idea? Uh, well, at the time, the robust cuts were exhausted. So all known cuts for CVRP were already used but the gaps were still somehow large. And uh, so people started with no robust cuts. No robust cuts uh, are potentially stronger, but uh, with those problems, they, they had to very carefully add those cuts because if you add more, say, like 50 cuts, your price and explode. And uh, this idea of uh, limited memory cut was that you could make the cut weaker, but uh, that weakening of the cut uh, reduced a lot the impact in the pricing. So mm -hmm. instead of 50 cuts, you could add 500. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the weakness of the cut can be adjusted dynamically. And in the end, you do not lose enough. You achieve the, the potential gap mm -hmm. that you obtained. Yeah, excellent. And uh, that was nice. So uh, we could solve a quite larger instance than, than before. Yeah, yeah. I remember that because we we kept on feeding you with upper bounds. So. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Lot to... yeah right. Uh, you got yet another Ipco paper out of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, an interesting, not so interesting, but. Uh, the story was that uh, the full paper uh, that I considered to be a, a very good paper, <laughs> it was rejected at uh, a major OR journal, then uh, sadly, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we resubmitted it to Mathematical Programming Computation, that's a very good journal. And uh, there was a happy ending because the rejected paper eventually was chosen as the best paper of 2017. Uh, yeah that you're fantastic yeah well deserved <laughs> yeah 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 fantastic <laughs> uh but uh, uh you know you 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 guys uh kept on solving uh instances to optimality and uh eventually the 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 benchmark uh that the benchmarks that were available uh at that time got somewhat obsolete maybe and then you had the idea of, of proposing a new benchmark. I, I was proud to be part of that uh, project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can you comment about that, please? Yes, uh, around 2014, uh, the, the benchmark instances that uh, were being used for decades for testing the algorithms on CVRP, they became obsolete because of the progress not only on exact algorithms but also on the risk algorithms so the uh, all uh, algorithms could easily find the the, op the instance that we could prove that were indeed optimal and uh, so uh, there were a few harder instances but they were quite artificial so uh, we uh, you me and other co-authors uh, we proposed a, a new set of instances uh, they were carefully the Devise it in order to mimic uh, the real world applications. And uh, we also created the CVRP Lib. So it's a site that uh, has a large number of visitors. So, uh, and that CVRP Lib actually established a nice kind of competition, uh, the good kind of competition. Mm -hmm. So uh, any person or group can submit an improving solution if you find an improving solution for one of those instances, you can submit that. And we check the solution and we post. 
And uh, last year, 2020, uh, seven diff distinct groups from all over the world submitted improvement solutions. Uh, there were 23 posts in total. So uh, research on CVRP is now very active. Mm -hmm. This is very good. Yeah, yeah. I think these new instances uh, helped uh, to attract researchers to, to revisit uh, this mm -hmm. very classical problem and to produce new and more uh, original uh, heuristic uh, algorithms for that. Um, I think also uh, the Dimax challenge can can be a good way to 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 uh, test uh, the new methods for for VRP variants in general, right? Yes, the uh, Dimax challenge. Uh, I think uh, it would be a very important competition. So the the challenge was scheduled to happen this year, but due to the pandemic, it was postponed. To, uh, 2022, and uh, it will have several tracks. Uh, I am more uh, directly involved in two of them, the CVRP and the VRP with time windows, but uh, there are other people like uh, Claudia Arquetti and Thibaut Vidal, and uh, even some people that uh, you already, already, already interviewed before, like Mauricio Rezendi and Panos Pardalos. And uh, I think that competition uh, is coming in the right time. Uh, the interest in Velika route is very strong, uh, not only on the CVRP, as I mentioned, but uh, for other variants. Uh, so I think uh, I expect a very large number of competitors trying different ideas, different methods. So, uh, I'm, we're um, eager to to see the, that competition happening. Right, I think it's a it's a great chance to to also compare uh, the traditional ideas, uh, the traditional heuristic ideas, with those that have been proposed that are combining uh, exact algorithms with uh, heuristic algorithms, or even introducing machine learning ideas and so on. Right, it can be a Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are, we uh, would be very glad if people tried new approaches, uh, even if they do not provide necessarily the very best results. But uh, if you can show that a different approach uh, is at least competitive, uh, this can be interesting. Yeah, right. I think uh, I'm not sure if it was 2011 or something. Uh, I was I was leaving Niteroi uh, at that time uh, that you started a formal collaboration with the guys from Bordeaux? Yes, uh, well, in 2011, uh, uh, Francois van der Beek uh, is well known, is one of the greatest uh, specialists in column generation. Uh, at that time, he already had uh, developed a uh, BAP code, a uh, general framework for column generation. And uh, we, we started a collaboration, so together with our two PSOA from our side, and uh, with Ruslan Sadikov uh, from Bordeaux, uh, you interviewed uh, mm -hmm. him recently. And uh, we wrote uh, two papers, uh, one on uh, stabilization, do stabilization for column generation, and another paper on diving the risks for column generation too. Uh, okay, it was a good collaboration, but uh, that collaboration really got uh, momentum in 2015 when uh, Rezan came to UF for a one-year sabbatical with us, uh, mm -hmm. bringing his wife and two children. And uh, Rezan, uh, taking advantage of his own expertise in many years uh, coding for different problems, he coded a new branch cut and price algorithm that uh, incorporates all the recent advances on CVRP. But he did that in a much more generic way. And moreover, uh, he also produced uh, several new ideas. So it was a very uh, fruitful time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that led to the development of VRP Solver. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the code that uh, Rosen developed uh, while with us uh, was the basis for creating VRP Solver. Uh, what is VRP Solver? Uh, is a package. It's available for academic purpose. You can download it. 
Uh, it can be used to, for solving most classic uh, VRP variants. Uh, it usually has a very good performance. And uh, uh, very recently, uh, it could solve a CVRP instance with uh, 855 customers. It, it's a record. Mm -hmm. So it's documented. You know? mm -hmm, yeah. And, uh, uh, and however, uh, VRP Solver uh, is not a typical VRP software in the sense that uh, there are no boxes for the user to tick to indicate if the problem has time windows, it has heterogeneous fleet, and so on. Uh, it's it's actually actually closer to a uh, MIP Solver. So the user has a Julia language interface for creating a model. That model has all the traditional MIP uh, variables and constraints. You can uh, use uh, any kind of uh, linear constraint to that. But there are also other built-in constructs for implicitly, uh, be a bit technical here, for implicitly defining an exponential large number of path variables. Those variables are related to the solutions of uh, resource constraint and shortest path. So the the problem cannot be, the, that model cannot be solved by branch and cut. It had to be solved by branch cut and price. So this is what uh, VRP Solver is. So uh, you create a new application in VRP Solver by building a model, matching the way that you build a model in a MIP Solver. It's, uh, it's like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good part of this is that the VRP Solver is indeed generic and uh, even obtaining good results on uh, some classic problems that are usually not seen as VRPs, for example, the, the classic beam packing, the generalized assignment problem, uh, parallel machine scaling, mm -hmm. no problem with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my, my own students are using a VRP Solver here. Of course, you're a bit biased because you had Teobaldo, uh, Bulhões, Eduardo Queiroga, and now João that is doing PGBT, they're all worked uh, on the demos and contributed a lot on the solver. But I think it's uh, uh, it's a sort of a shortcut to to get access to the state of the art and modern uh, exact algorithms for VRP-like problems. And uh, we, for example, with the student that we are collaborating, you were involved too. We we, I mean, with few days of coding and you know not really much effort, he could quickly uh, find state-of-the-art solutions. Uh, so that's that's one big advantage of VRP Solver. Of course, you get to, you have to get used to the uh, mapping and the, the, the modeling uh, approach, uh, but uh, it's a pretty, pretty powerful tool and I encourage people to use it, uh, you know. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, VRP Solver, uh, it's not as user friendly as it could be. In fact, uh, it's an academic software, so uh, there are still uh, the documentation is not so good and uh, perhaps even a few bugs. But uh, I think that as a tool, it has a, a really uh, big potential. Yeah, you published that. Uh, again, yes, IPCO. Uh, <laughs> IPCO again, yeah, IPCO again, and mathematical programming. Huh? And uh, uh, I was glad that was published in IPCO uh, because uh, it's a work on the uh, the article on uh, describes VRP Solver. It's describing a model, so uh, it was nice to have it published in IPCO uh, that uh, usually accepts more theoretical works. Uh, but I really believe that uh, devising that model is, uh, is an important contribution. So, uh, and actually, when our tour presented at IPCO, uh, Andrea Lada remarked that it was the first time that uh, an IPCO presentation had a software demo. So he, he, he did a software, a real-time software demonstration there. Uh -huh. So it was nice. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so moving on to different topic. Uh, you know, there is all this debate involving OR and artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Uh, what are your views? Well, uh, first thing is that, uh, as I told you, uh, I started my scientific training, uh, both as undergrad and when working at the financial market in artificial intelligence. So, uh, 
I was very excited when, not many years ago, machine learning started to really deliver on tasks like uh, speech and image processing, uh, playing games of Go and chess. Uh, uh, I like playing chess. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, and it's uh, certainly uh, an exciting development for OR because uh, it can be used for handling EU-structured problems, problems like uh, you have stochastic uh, characteristics, you have online, so your data is not only uncertain, but part of the data will only be known in the future. So the op optimization problem is mixed with a forecasting problem. And uh, this is pretty hard to model using the conventional OR and machine learning may be a, a good approach for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so instead, uh, so you train a neural network with several examples and you, you will find some reasonable solution. Uh, moreover, uh, OR techniques can also help on machine learning because uh, machine learning is an optimization problem. Okay, so OR can help on machine learning. And the opposite is true. Machine learning can definitely help on classic OR methods. Uh, for example, uh, inside our algorithms, for example, in the branch and bound algorithm, there is a, a risk decision how to select the variable to branch. And uh, certainly machine learning can help on that decision. So you can put, some, uh, put machine learning to help on some elements inside our algorithms. Uh, Yet, uh, I see a clear machine learning hype. And uh, I'll explain about that. Uh, first is that uh, I see articles on any possible topic, uh, say, for example, archaeology, that are being accepted only because they use machine learning. And even if only for tasks where classic statistics say linear regression would do the job. Uh, but OK. The, the machine learning hype uh, will not harm archaeology. But I think this is dangerous for OR in some sense. Some potential students, some people from industry, and even some people from funding agencies are now seeing OR without machine learning as outdated, mm -hmm. no matter what the problem is. And uh, I have seen cases where customers are already arrived, say that they want machine learning in their systems, no matter what the problem. And I have also seen cases where researchers that started doing machine learning yesterday mm -hmm. being given preference over solid OR researchers. So uh, I think that the OR community should be a bit more assertive and try to sort out things and point out the misconceptions of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, I, I see that hype as well. I, I, you, you, our own students, uh, when they're joining our computer engineering or even computer science courses, they, they tend to uh, get really impressed by uh, the, the potential and the clear uh, advantages of using our AI and machine learning. Uh, but that's that's somewhat is uh, uh, making OR look old-fashioned. <laughs> and it should it should not. No? It should yeah. not. Uh, OR is a thriving field. Uh, we are improving a lot. Uh, each year we, we have new ideas, new techniques, and uh, uh, so. But I, I think that the, one of the there are le lessons to be learned from that. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons for the popularity of machine learning is the low barrier for entry. So I mean that uh, an undergrad can follow a course in YouTube, then download a package, and after some Python code, already start doing something in machine learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I will explain. I will example, give an example of what I do. Built an advanced branch branch enterprise algorithm requires a PhD, so this is bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that the complexity is not a problem in itself, as long as that complexity is properly encapsulated. For example, MIPS overs. So MIPS overs are highly complex pieces of code. They use ideas developed over fifty years, and they, but they were they are well encapsulated and many people can use it okay mm -hmm. perhaps not as easily as the machine learning tools because uh, you need to learn to model, model yeah 
yes, it's not that easy. Uh, sometimes we, from OR, we forget that uh, modeling using uh, linear constraints is not so obvious as we believe. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, and uh, I really think that uh, we, from OR, we need to advance in that direction. We should be able to encapsulate our products into something that can be used by people that are not PhDs. Mm -hmm. And the uh, VRP solver is uh, one attempt of, uh, of doing that. Coluna is also a, a very nice initiative, right? To yes, yes, yes. So sense. Coluna uh, is an initiative to produce uh, an open source. Uh, it's being coded in Julia language, an open source framework for uh, branch cut and press. That's a basic framework because now uh, VRP Solver is coded on top of BAP code, but BAP code is not open source. There mm -hmm. are uh, intellectual property issues, it cannot be made open source. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, Colon is being developed by a group of volunteers, and uh, we expect that uh, when Colon is sufficiently uh, developed, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we'll move uh, VRP Solver to Colon. So uh, it will be uh, open source too. Yeah. So the code will be 100% uh, developed in Julia, uh, except for the CVRP SAP package. Not, not uh, no. Uh, some parts of it would still be in C++, but uh, most of the the control would be available to users uh, much mm -hmm. more than today. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So Ushua, uh, I I see that you still have a lot of interest in uh, CVRP, uh, even though you you uh, kind of mastered the problem and and solved the many many instances to optimality, uh, and I, I you know I when we were together at UF I could see how how excited you were when seeing the logs and seeing the the code running. And you know, doing fine tuning uh, and all that. I mean, you 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 put a lot of effort into it. But uh, at 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 some point, uh, y y you see that uh, motivation may 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 be an issue, right? Uh, you know, working on the same problem, and you have the best exact algorithm for that. Uh, but you still keep on pushing the limits. Uh, and what motivates you to to keep on? Uh, going with this uh, obsessive work? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are times where uh, when I'm not obsessive, <laughs> that, uh, I do other things. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, uh, in general, my main reward from uh, my work, from academic work, is actually mentoring students because uh, it's very gratifying when you see them growing and then following the, their own paths, either in academy or in industry. Uh, I will name some uh, my former and present students, uh, Ricardo Fukazawa, Humberto Longo, Haroldo Santos, uh, Lorenzo Moreno, uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost chron chronological. Uh, Diego Pessin, uh, José Maurício Gonçalves, André Velasco, Luiz Henrique Santana, Hugo Kramer, Teobaldo Bulhões, Eduardo Queiroga, and João Marcos Pereira. And the, the last four came from the uh, Federal of Paraíba, uh, indicated by you. I'm mm -hmm. very grateful for that. And uh, they are an integral part of all that. Uh, if I achieved something, uh, it's because of them. And uh, about the research uh, itself, uh, uh, we know that what we do uh, is small uh, when we see from a proper perspective, because there's a huge science building that has been in the construction for centuries, but we are happy when we can add one or two bricks to it, uh, it makes us happy, so our curiosity is fulfilled. And, uh, and it's fun. <laughs> One thing I think fun is the important thing. So yeah. Thank you for your nice words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that you really enjoy uh, what you do. Uh, that's that's very special. Uh, was there any? Uh, was there a time that uh, you you 
thought of giving up or switching careers, even doing the PhD or um, after, you know, uh, joining OOF or you, you always felt that, uh, no, this is my thing. I love it. And uh, it's, it's very hard to give away. No, not really. Uh, after uh, I started uh, from the master, I never uh, seriously considering uh, another career. Uh, I have plans for the future. Uh, we always think that uh, what we have done until now uh, is not good enough. <laughs> but, uh, I have plans for my future, but uh, in, the, in the academic area. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can keep on collaborating, uh, which is has been a, a hell of a, mm. of adventure. I mean, at least for me, Ushua, personally, uh, it it has been wonderful uh, mm. uh, to work with you. Um, I was very lucky to to have met Satoru and you uh, about thirteen years ago or so, uh, <laughs> and Satoru even earlier. Um, and uh, I mean having the, the, the environment at OOF, uh, you know, spending uh, time at, uh, you know, the Computing Institute and also at Lodges uh, made a huge difference in my background. Uh, we tried somewhat to, to uh, replicate a lot, of, a lot of things that we learned there, not only myself, Telbaldo, also, who is who's, uh, my colleague here and he worked with you. So uh, all this collaboration has been uh, really inspiring. And uh, <clears throat> let's hope we can have excellent students in the future so we can keep on uh, you know, doing this uh, work that we, we started a long time ago. So Shoa, for me, uh, you know, it, it was super special to have you here. I thank you so much for your time and your interest and all your support in this project. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, you were a very special person to, not only to, to me, but also to, to uh, your former students. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Well, I would like to, just to finish to, uh, to congratulate you for this very nice initiative of uh, producing this series of interviews. Uh, I think this is a really important uh, contribution to our community. Thank you for everything. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> my, my, my parents will love that. <laughs> Thank you, Shoa. So uh, let's hope we can meet in person soon and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank Ciao. You. Bye. Bye.